Good morning, everybody. My name is Kim Hargrave, and I'm the Education Director here at the Denison Pequot Seacoast Nature Center. And I'm really excited to be talking about bird nests. This is the time of year when a lot of our birds are starting to nest. They're starting to scope out their territories. You might see them chasing each other, and usually those are the males and females starting their mating rituals, or a male chasing away another male. And I wanted to show you some of the variety of things that birds use to make their bird nests with, and maybe a few ways that you could help out the birds that are in your yard. So I thought today it might be fun to kind of start with my absolute most favorite nest. And it is this one right here. This little tiny nest is the nest from the ruby-throated hummingbird. So hummingbirds have just made their official appearance here in the Mystic area over the last week or two. People have started to see them. I live out in Salem. I had my first one this um, Saturday. Cassandra here doing the filming had her first one last week as well. And so the ruby-throated hummingbirds, what happens is the male and the female mate, and then the female gets to work and the male goes off and does his thing. All right, and so what the female does is she finds just the right spot. When I have found hummingbird nests, I found them in a couple different places. One is large rhododendron plants near my house. So I've often seen them there. The other place is often in maple trees. They're gonna put their nest in the crook of a tree, like where the branch comes into the trunk and close to water, they seem to prefer as well. And what they do is they use very fine grasses and pine needles and hairs to start building the structure of their nest. But then do you see this fuzz right here? And it's on the inside of the nest as well. That is the fuzz from the cinnamon fern plants. So they actually go and they pick off all of that fuzz and then line their nests with it to make it really soft. To provide extra camouflage, do you guys recognize all this green stuff? It's all the lichens from trees and rocks. They pull that off and stick it to the side. And then to make their nest expandable, because mom usually lays two to three eggs, they're each the size of the tiny jelly beans, the babies are gonna start to grow. And so their nest needs to expand with them. She actually uses spider webs in her nest to make her nest grow outwards as her babies get larger. Absolutely incredible little nest right here. All Those right. are definitely my favorite. Yeah, so just a great little nest. Smallest bird that we have in Connecticut, so it's our smallest nest. Birds usually nest by size. So the biggest nests that we usually get here are from the bald eagle. And if you're up and down the Connecticut River at all, you'll see some eagle nests that are almost as big as this table here. All right, so just absolutely gigantic for eagles, super tiny for hummingbirds. All right, one of the most common nests that people seem to find around their house is this one. And one of the reasons why people are able to find them is they're pretty sturdy, so they're gonna last a little bit longer. All right, so this is the nest from a robin. Robins use, you know, sticks, they use hay, they use grass in their nests, but then they stick it all together with mud. So you can really see all that mud right here. So when we talk about ways that we can help birds and nesting, one of the things that we can do is to have a little bit of muddy spots at the edge of our yard so that the birds can go and collect that and use it to help stick their nests together. If you even look carefully, you're gonna see bark from some little trees and shrubs in there as well. So really, really neat nest to find is the robin's nest. Now robins usually have blue eggs and people mostly think that is so that it helps to blend in with the sky. Now there's another bird who's also a thrush. Robins belong to the thrush family. There's another thrush it's called the bluebird and bluebirds also have blue eggs, but you shouldn't ever see those in a nest like this because bluebirds are what we call cavity nesters. So cavity nesters are birds that nest in a hole in a tree. And you're looking at this and you're going, but that was made by a woodpecker. And you're absolutely right. The woodpeckers make all the cavity nesters, cavities for all the cavity nesting birds that we have. It's fairly amazing. Without woodpeckers, 
we wouldn't have natural spots for our bluebirds to lay their eggs. So bluebirds would, could use a natural cavity like this. However, what we're finding here in Connecticut, because we, for a long time, we didn't have a lot of good cavity spots for the birds, is that most of our bluebirds actually nest now in man-made boxes, just like this. And you can build a bluebird box. There's lots of great bluebird boxes online, or you can buy one. And um, the bluebirds will nest right in here. Now, bluebirds aren't our only cavity nesters, though. So we have another bird that loves to nest in these called the tree swallow. And I forgot to get my tree swallow nest out. I'm sorry. <laughs> but tree swallows also have our nesters in these boxes right here. And they're also blue in color. And they're a really great bird to see. They're a great bird to have around because they're in the flycatcher family, which means they're catching bugs for us all day long. So any bird that's blue in color coming into your bluebird boxes, that is a bird that you want to have there. And Kim, in our class the other day that you ran for us about encouraging birds to our backyards, you had pointed out that those tree swallows might be um, a little bit more aggressive in taking those boxes. So yes. you had a great hint for us of what to do. Yep. So the thing about tree swallows is they don't want other tree swallows too close to them. So what they'll do is they're going to be more aggressive. They're going to take over the box from a bluebird. But once they have a box, they don't care if a bluebird moves in next door, but they're not going to let another tree swallow move in next door. So you want to put in two boxes and one for the tree swallows and then one for the bluebirds. And that will help prevent um, other tree swallows from taking over the bluebird nest as well. And then you get both bluebirds and tree swallows. The reason why the tree swallows don't care when the bluebirds are next, next door is because tree swallows catch insects in the air where the um, bluebirds are catching insects on the ground. So they're using different spots to find their food. They just happen to nest in the same kind of spot. All right, now I wanted to show you another nest because we have a couple of these birds in for rehabilitation right now here at the Nature Center and they're called morning doves. They're cousins to our pigeon. Yes, Rosie is up in her spot and for anyone that's tuning in that has joined us before, Rosie will make an appearance, I'm quite sure, uh, but she is our white pigeon that resides here and so morning doves are in the same family. That's right, and I love morning doves but they're not good nest builders. You know, you take a look at that robin's nest, that amazing hummingbird nest, and I couldn't And then take we have this. this. I couldn't take the morning dove nest out of this container because it would fall to pieces. They literally pile up sticks and it's fairly loose. They try to balance it on whatever they can. And it is strong, like if, you know, it can support the weight of a morning dove. Because morning doves are fairly heavy birds, but it can't be handle a nice big gust of wind. It can't be jostled at all and things like that. So, so isn't it true that sometimes because their nests are not the strongest that they're more apt to have either eggs fall out or babies fall out? Yes, they definitely are. And so that brings me to the next thing is if you have a bird nest and you've kind of been keeping an eye on it from a distance, you don't want to get too close, but then one day you see a little nestling down on the ground it is absolutely okay for you to pick up that nestling and if it's not perched at all and they're, they're pretty bounceable stick it right back in the nest birds the majority of birds cannot smell so that old wives tale that oh mama bird's gonna smell you on it and reject your whole nest that's completely not true she might you know chirp at you a lot to say get away but she is not going to reject her nest so put the baby bird right back in the nest. And we also have fledglings right now, right? So That's those might true. be more apt to come out of the nest and it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to go back in. Um, mom and dad will keep feeding them. That's right. And so that's the other thing. Most birds, when they jump out of the nest the first time, their first flight is not successful and they end up on the ground. And so what happens is those birds stick fairly close to the area that the nest is in and mom and dad feed them from the ground until those birds learn to fly. Super important, if you know you have fledglings around, keep your cats inside, because cats will attack the fledglings. 
um, try to keep your dogs away from them as well. Now, these um, little fledglings, you know, if you pick them up and you bring them to us or pretty much any rehabilitator, we're going to be like, oh, bring it back home because mom bird raises her babies best. Birds are raised by their parents much better than they can be raised by a rehabilitator because the mom and dad bird can teach them all about the wild. So super important to make sure that you leave fledglings alone. You see a nestling so it doesn't really have any feathers, stick it right back in the nest. If the nest is way up high, you can't reach it. What we do is we put a little basket. We put that nest in the back, or we put some leaves in the basket, put it as close as possible, put the bird in there. Mom will feed at both nesting areas. So really, really important. And we also are having Steve chime in that has a mor- uh, he has a morning dove that built a nest on the stepladder mm-hmm. where it leaned against the side of the house. So that is also something we get a lot of questions of this time of year yeah. about the nests that are maybe built in an area. Oh, there she is. Um, where maybe we wouldn't be as excited to have them. Maybe a wreath on the front door because yeah. we've had some of those. And we just suggest if you can avoid that spot or if you have another door to enter your house, please do so and enjoy watching those little ones grow and get bigger and then when they fledge that's when it's a good time to uh move that nest along take that nest down and then pay attention i also warn people because some of our birds will have two broods of babies during the year and they often will reuse the nest they'll usually build a brand new nest every season but they might use the same nest twice in the summer so if you know the fledge the babies are um you know they've all fledged mom and dad aren't hanging out there too much yet take the nest down because otherwise she might end up using it again and it'll be another six weeks before you can um, you know, go in and out of your front door and things like that without being squawked at. Um, Robin is tuning in is asking when we can expect hummingbirds in Connecticut. And we actually have had reports actually for a few weeks now of them being back. Kim just reported where she lives in Salem that you had your, your first ones back over the weekend. Yep. And I know um, I reside in Hope Valley, Rhode Island. And our hummingbirds are back as well. So we have a certain behavior. We have a little bit of a bully in our hummingbird um, population, and he's officially back. So keep an eye out. Keep those feeders filled and cleaned. And Kim, what do we recommend in terms of the ratio for hummingbird food? So hummingbird food is really important and super easy just to make it from home. You use, I use a one to four ratio. So what I do is I take my two cup measuring cup, my glass measuring cup, put two cups of water in it, heat it up, dump a half cup of sugar in it, let it, you know, stir it together until the sugar dissolves, let it cool and refill my feeder. I try to refill my feeder, um, especially right now where there's not a lot of hummingbirds at it. I refill it um, every week. So every Saturday I dump it out and put fresh food in, even if the food's not gone, because sometimes it can get moldy and things like that. So it's really important to keep it clean. So. And we want to make sure that people aren't adding any red dye because that is actually not good for hummingbirds. Nope. We okay. do have another question moving on to another bird is the cowbird. Yes. So Leanne has a cowbird egg in their house finch nest and wants to know if we have any suggestions. So cowbirds are a native species here in Connecticut. So they're not invasive in the way that sometimes we think of, you know, other like house sparrows and things like that. Cowbirds are what we consider a parasitic bird though. So what they do is mom just lays an egg in a nest when the other, you know, there's a few other eggs in there and she is, they say it's like a house finch, you know, mom house finch is out grabbing some food, doing some nest work. Mom will sneak in, that cowbird mom, and lay an egg. The problem is that cowbirds are larger than all the other birds. And for some reason, the, you know, the mom bird of the nest doesn't realize that that baby's not one of hers. And because that bird's bigger and a little more aggressive, it gets the majority of the food. So often her her babies don't survive. And that's the problem with cowbirds. Um, You can make a choice. Some people will remove cowbird eggs. Some people won't because they are, you know, part of um, our ecosystem here. And the picture that we used for this Facebook event um, is actually of an eastern Phoebe nest. And that egg that looks different than the others, that was a brown-headed cowbird egg. Right in there. All right, so if we look right here, I want to show you a couple more nests. This is someone else's favorite. (laughs) This is a really cool nest right here. This is the nest from a Baltimore Oriole, which are also back already in the area. So think about those beautiful orange birds that um, we have around here. And they weave their nest together. Just take a look at that. They are some of the best engineers that we have for nest building around here. 
and they make their nest like a little bag and so those eggs are very well protected right down there at the bottom you can see there's some extra material in the bottom all right and you can see how they wove it around all of these sticks right here to help protect it now most of the time when i find a baltimore oriole nest i tend not to find them till winter time and once the leaves have come down and i often see them fairly high up in trees doesn't mean they're always going to be high up but that's often where i have spotted the baltimore oriole nests here so just woven together so well all right so another bird that is you know just an amazing little nester and will nest anywhere they want to is the house wren so these cute tiny little brown birds whose tails stick up and they are what we consider a messy nester and they're the people the birds that you leave an old pair of boots out on your front porch they'll nest in that i've had people bring in parts of gutters with house sparrow nests in they'll nest in wreaths just like the house benches they love to nest in your hanging front porch plants um, and their nests can all be a little different shape depending on what type of container they've decided to put their nest in so this one was actually in a basket <laughs> that somebody had and um, unfortunately um, the nest was abandoned so there's still some little eggs in there you can see how they're speckled and camouflaged and what I'm doing to recognize it is looking at all of these leaves around the outside edge right there that the house sparrow uses the other thing that's neat to see that mom and dad used were pine needles they used dry pine needles so birds find all sorts of materials to make their nests you don't need to put any materials out for them some people like to put yarn and things like that that can actually cause problems for the birds um you know it can get wrapped around a leg and it's you know yarn's pretty strong and it might actually hurt a little one in there or catch mom or catch dad so much better just to let the birds use natural materials um, a fun thing to try at home is to see if you are as good at building a nest as somebody else and so what we have here at the nature center are these little blocks that have holes in them and then we go out and we find little twigs that we cut and we go out and get materials and we try to actually build bird nests with these really fun thing to try at home what we find is we are nowhere as good as birds at it using our hands and i just think about it birds are doing all of this work just with their beaks all right they're weaving all these things together so just absolutely incredible all right next bird i want to talk about quickly the the bird that actually builds the cavity nests which is the woodpeckers so woodpeckers You'll see them going up and down the sides of trees, pulling off bark to get insects out. And then you'll see them pecking in one spot to actually make their nest. So this is what it's gonna look like from the outside, just a big hole in the tree. And then we have what it looks like when this tree was cut down. You can see the inside of the nest right there. So the birds will nest in there. And then the babies are actually able to climb out the rough side of this hole so a really really neat thing for birds and can we have different types of um, woodpeckers here in Connecticut and Rhode Island as well yes so um, we have several different kinds the most common one for us to see um, are the downy woodpeckers so they're the little black and white looks like little black and white ladders on them um, and then our largest woodpeckers are the pileated woodpeckers and they often we call them the woody woodpecker ones so, you know they're about this big and their holes are large and tend to be more squarish than some of our other woodpeckers but you'll definitely hear them pecking away this year woodpeckers sometimes will reuse a nest from year to year or they'll find a nest and move into it but most years they do build new nests that means lots of extra holes for our other cavity nesters a few other cavity nesting birds that you may not realize are birds like chickadees are actually cavity nesters so all, having all these extra holes is really important. And right. even things like um, eastern screech owls are cavity nesters. That's right. Eastern screech owls and kestrels are cavity nesters. And we have this great box right here that one of our volunteers, AJ, made for us. And I showed it last week, but I wanted to show it again because this is something else that you can put up to help other birds. So certain hawks, like um, red-shouldered hawks, actually nest in trees. But other birds of prey even are cavity nesters including barred owls as well and so a barred owl box is even larger than this one um one more thing i just want to show you just to show you this really cool egg right here that is from a red-shouldered hawk 
Um, and so you can see the speckles on that egg and every egg's a little bit unique. Um, let's see what else I got here. Oh, take a look at this sparrow nest right here. Look at the long strands. Sometimes they will steal um, hair from your dog or from your horse's tail. If you have a horse, you might see a sparrow coming by and actually taking some of that hair. And that looks like such a traditional bird nest. It if is. people were to draw a bird nest at home, it would look very similar to that. As you are mentioning eggs though, we had a question from Jessica who would like to know if those are real eggs in that tree that we showed, the woodpecker nest. Unfortunately they are. And so um, this is one of the reasons why we discourage people from doing large um, wood cutting projects at this time of year. This was brought to us, oh my goodness, probably 10 years ago or so. The person felt um, really bad. And so they had accidentally cut, they'd cut down this tree and found the eggs inside. One thing to keep in mind, if you do accidentally disturb a bird nest or you find an egg on the ground that a predator disturbed, most likely those eggs are not going to hatch. But the mom or the female birds do tend to relay eggs. So if she is unsuccessful, you know, she lays an egg and something happens to the nest or the egg gets stolen, she will try again. And so while it can be kind of disheartening to see the eggs, know that most birds do try to lay their eggs again. And we do have some people that reach out to us because as you're alluding to, sometimes you might actually find that full intact egg in your yard. Yep. Um, it's not because a robin was hopping by and the egg just fell out. No. Uh, what generally causes that to happen? Usually there's a predator that um, grabbed the egg and for some reason dropped it as they were leaving the area. So that tends to be what has happened when you find um, an egg on the ground. And so that usually means, unless you happen to see, that you know exactly where the nest is, you can put the try to put the egg back. Otherwise, you just want to um, just, you know, you can just move the egg um, so it's out of the way, but um, incubating it is not a good idea. It's not really a good strategy just because um, most likely that egg's been shaken a lot. You know, it's dropped out of the nest, it's been carried by a predator. And also, once that bird hatches, you do have a baby bird that needs care. And you think about how hard bird parents work, they're feeding those babies every 15 minutes and teaching them all about the wild. And it would be very difficult to st um, simulate that care 100% in captivity. So much better, um, you know, just to kind of leave bird nests alone and let that mom bird, you know, relay her eggs again. So again, things to keep in mind about bird nests is a look around your yard. If you have lots of leaf areas with a few leaves out, you have grapevines, things like that. You have pine needles on the ground. Um, all of those things, leave them around your yard, um, don't clean them up, and don't put out artificial materials for the birds. And you'll find lots of birds nesting in your yard, although you may not realize it because they have such good camouflage until the fall. And that's when I recommend going out and taking a look for bird nests. Usually, um, you know, after the leaves have fallen, so around Thanksgiving time, then start taking a peek in your tree and you'll be like, there's a bird nest here, there's a bird nest here, and including in those front shrubberies. And again, my favorite spot to look for is in my I have big, giant, overgrown rhododendron, and that's where I find bird nests every year. And sometimes I don't realize it until, you know, until the fall. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed learning about all these different bird nests. We're going to chime in with one other question that came in from Marie. She has a rope that they hang their bird feeders on, but the birds are taking off small pieces. She suspects it's for their nest. Is that bad for them? Um, it depends if, if um, what the bird, the, the rope is made out of. If it's cotton, it's probably not so bad. If it's that plasticky nylon stuff, it, it's not so great for them. All right. Vera chimes in that they do, in fact, love horse hair as she has some horses at home. Um, let's just scroll through. Oh, Abigail had a question about, uh, and Juliet had a question about what an osprey egg looks like. So, so we. Osprey egg um, is going to be, a, it's, I don't have one to show you, unfortunately, but it's going to be a little bit larger than the red um, shouldered hawk egg just because ospreys are larger. Can you birds. hold that just yeah, so we can show size reference? And so you can see it right here so in my hand. So it's bigger than so that So a little bit size. bigger than this and slightly speckled. Okay. We can always post a picture yeah, for we'll her later. Yeah, post a picture later on. And our ospreys are nesting right now, so they should be, you should be able to see them sitting on their nests. Perfect. We have a question from Misty who wants to know if there are any pink birds living in Connecticut. Pink birds. 
Well, the rose breasted gross bee cast, but it's more of a reddish color. We do have purple finches, so they're, I would say they're more purpley, but um, no birds that I know of that are very pink. Some that can have, like morning doves can have a little bit of pink tinge to them and things like that, but um, nothing I can think of off the top of my head, but if we think of one, we'll let you know. No, but in terms of fun markings, is it the glossy ibis? It's that really scarlet color? Yeah, it can be iridescent, a lot of birds. And the ruby-throated hummingbird just has that flash of... And that's just on the males, whereas the females will have that pale throat. Yep. Someone did have a question about, is that a bird making a sound in the background? And of course, she's back in her hiding spot. Um, but Rosie if you can see, oh, see that white moving around? That is Rosie. She is our white pigeon that lives here at the Nature Center. Um, Jenny has a question of if she should still put out her bird feeders in the summer. So that depends on where you live. Um, it is absolutely fine to fill your bird feeders as long as you don't live in a spot with lots of bears. Um, and so um, here in Connecticut, if you live um, you know, in the northwestern corner of the state or anywhere that we have a large active bear population, you do not want to put your bird feeders out. But otherwise, absolutely fine to fill your bird feeders all summer long. Just make sure you clean them um, on a regular basis because you're more likely to get, you know, with the warmer temperatures, mold and mildew to build up in the seeds. And something some people don't realize is that with your finch feeders in particular, that finches are prone to conjunctivitis. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure you clean that. Um, so we do get birds in every year that have conjunctivitis, and it can transfer to other birds as well. Jessica would like to know, how do robins collect mud? They use their little beak, and so a little like they pinch it up and carry it in their beak and then stick it on. So think about this. This is a lot of mud to do one little piece at a time, all right? So it takes a long time. For a lot of these birds, it can take a week or two to build their nests. And depending on the species, sometimes mom and dad work together. Other times, it's just the female. All right. So Susan lives in Vermont and is wondering if the birds we spoke of are also up in Vermont. And I would say most of these are, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. All the ones that we talked about today would definitely be up in Vermont as well. Um, your hummingbirds may not be there just yet, or they're, you know, I could see them more being in southern Vermont, but another week that, well, depending on where you live in Vermont, um, they'll be up to see you as well. Um, Barbara has a question of what do we recommend to do about invasive birds? So house sparrows are the and starlings are the most challenging invasive birds that um, can impact um, our nesting birds. A few things to keep in mind, like if you build a bluebird box, you make, you make sure you get uh, the proper measurements, because if you make the hole too big, the starling will nest in there and it will actually kill the babies. Um, and so uh, the bluebird, so you want to put one uh, the whole size, and I can't remember the exact diameter of the whole size, but you make it, the bluebird can get in, and the, uh, um, a, but the starling cannot. So that's really, really important on your bluebird boxes. Make sure it's designed for a bluebird. Um, the other thing that we do is we really recommend people monitor their bluebird boxes for house sparrows. So if you see a house sparrow hanging around, you scare it away and you remove the nests that they start. And you want to do it on a regular basis so that you don't actually, um, that way you don't have to worry about that there's babies in there or anything like that. And if you remove their nest enough times from the house barrel, they'll give up. Because it and takes a lot of energy to make those nests. Yeah, you know, if you've been building for three or four days and you've got to start again and start again, they will give up. And that discourages the house sparrow from your nest. Amy had a question. Is red hummingbird water from the store not good? Not a good idea at all. Much better just to buy, you know, a thing of sugar and water because the artificial colors aren't good for the hummingbird. All right. I think that is for most of these. Um, Yelena has a question. What to do if she sees an abandoned nest? So the best thing to do is just leave it there. Um, and so if you leave it there, it can be part, just become part of nature. Some birds will take pieces of it and it will go back into the soil and to the ground and become part of, of nature again. Oh, and Haley has bluebird, uh, baby bluebirds at their house. So Yay. congratulations. That's All right, fun. everyone, thank you for joining us today for learning about bird nests, bird eggs, and the birds that are residing here in Connecticut. We look forward to having you join us next week. Again, we'll be coming to you live Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 10 a.m. So we look forward to seeing you then. Have a great day. Bye.